You know, this is a really incredible time. The world is in a real moment. And I think, you know, what happened to George Floyd, when I saw that video, I was shocked and horrified, as I think anyone watching that video is. But it also immediately made me think of the case of David Dungay here in Australia, who also said, I can't breathe more than 12 times before he died. And he was an Aboriginal man who was in prison. He was being restrained by four prison guards. And there's been no justice for that. Well, thank you so much for joining me for the very first episode of the Justice Matters podcast. Guys, I couldn't be more excited. You know, right now we are facing a a pretty big moment um, as a globe. Uh, Right now there's Black Lives Matter protests that have been, have, have been sparked um, by the terrible, terrible uh, death of George Floyd and, and so many other lives. And even Australia as a nation, we are being forced to reckon with our own racist past. I've got Elaine Pearson on the show today. I couldn't think of anyone else I would want on the show for the very first episode. She's the Australian director of Human Rights Watch. Uh, She has been in that role for seven years. She has traveled the world working for NGOs. She's lived in Bangkok, Thailand. She's lived in the UK, the USA. She's lived in uh, um, in Nepal. Uh, She's traveled extensively for her work, and she brings with her such clarity, understanding, such insight, and really firsthand knowledge as she shares stories, even from her own past, her own upbringing here in Australia, where she was a firsthand experience of racism here Um, She really, really does, um, I think, set things off incredibly for what I hope this podcast to be, a place where we really discover uh, that justice really does matter. Look, guys, let's go to the interview. Thank you so much for joining me, and uh, I'll see you on the other side. Thank you so much, Elaine, for coming on to the Justice Matters podcast podcast um i'm super excited to to be able to spend this time with you we almost got you in the studio uh a few couple weeks back uh but unfortunately the COVID 19 restrictions didn't allow you to get across the border um yeah i'm really pleased to do it too just sorry that the borders didn't cooperate ah that's okay and it would have been so good to catch up with you and cam now i first met you guys probably a, a decade ago in New York, where we both were living, um, I was I met Cam playing footy for the New York Magpies, uh, which is kind of like, uh, well, you could probably explain how, how serious we were, right, Elaine? <laughs> <laughs> a bit more social. Yeah, well, it, I think it was just a good excuse for Aussies in New York to get together. Not that my husband Cam's even an Aussie, he's a Kiwi, but there he you picked go. up Aussie rules in Bangkok of all places. So Yeah, totally. <laughs> and 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 he was actually I remember he was doing a lot of um training drills with us. He's quite the uh quite the uh drills expert when it comes to fitness, so it was good always having him on the team and um anyways, it was really great to get to know you there and always kind of we kind of stayed in touch over the the years here and there as as you've done a lot of traveling. You're quite the globe trotter um in your life. Now, I I got a bit sneaky and and had a chat with Cam um just to just to get a few few uh bit of sneaky background information but you uh have been to i don't know lost count countries but where did you go recently that was quite uh, interesting oh gosh um well antarctica um that was not well <laughs> antarctica <laughs> Um, yeah, that was not a work trip. I was not investigating human rights abuses there. Um, that was a holiday actually with my mother, and I felt very grateful to be able to yeah go there. Um, obviously, just before all the craziness and the COVID lockdown began, um, and then actually right before COVID, yep. I was in Geneva and Paris, um, having some work meetings, particularly around the Human Rights Council. Uh, because Australia is a member of the Human Rights Council. So that was my last uh, international trip. Um, and it doesn't seem like I'm going to be doing any more traveling in the short term, at least, unfortunately. I know, which is um, probably hard for travel travel bugs like you and, and Cam. Um, but uh, you are an expert at penguins, right? So at least you can... Uh... <laughs> 
I uh, am. Penguin it's... expert, whale expert. Oh, it was amazing. I never knew before I went to Antarctica that there were so many different types of penguins, but now I know them all. Oh, that's so cool. I, I, that is a bucket list for me to be able to go to Antarctica. I'm super jealous. Um, but we're not here just to talk about penguins and all that <laughs> fun stuff. Um, right now, you're the Australian Director of uh, Astra- uh, of Human Rights Watch. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. And, that's uh, right. Why don't you let us know? I'm, I'm, would love to know more, and I'm sure our listeners would love to know a bit more about what Human Rights Watch is, who they are, and can you tell me a bit more? more about your role? Yeah, um, Human Rights Watch is a global organisation. So our headquarters are in New York, but we operate in about 90 countries around the world. And we have about just over 400 staff and about 100 of them are researchers. And I guess the main thing that we do is we investigate human rights abuses wherever they occur around the world, so in some 90 countries around the world. Uh, We then expose those abuses through our reporting, through the media, and then we um, advocate for change. And so my job is not so much at the research end, but more at the advocacy end. So I'm the person lobbying the government, trying to press particularly the Australian government to take action on our recommendations Uh, with respect to reports that we do here in Australia on human rights abuses, but also reports that we do all around the world um, on issues because, you know, ultimately, yeah, Australia is part of the international community. Mm -hmm. It's a member of the Human Rights Council. And we often want the Australian government um, to speak up and address issues, particularly ones that are happening um, in this region and particularly where we see that Australia has a role to play. So that's really my job, I guess, in a nutshell. I worked for Human Rights Watch in New York uh, Mm -hmm. when we met, and my job there was a bit different. I was supervising a team of researchers working across um, Southeast Asia. Mm. But now that I'm back in Australia, um, my job is more looking at the Australian government and opportunities to sort of lobby there. But I still continue to supervise our work in Indonesia, um, which also includes the work we do on West Papua. And that's super so close to me. Here. That's super close to me because I was born in Indonesia and I actually spent the first few years of my life in West Papua in Jayapura, which uh, you'd be very familiar with. I know we were having a chat uh, the other day, and um, you know that yeah, there's so much that's going on in in our region in Southeast Asia, in Australia, in 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 the Pacific that we really, really I think don't really know about so i'm really glad to have you on on the show today and and you know you've some people may have seen you on on q a or other programs that are out there and and i really appreciate the way that you've kind of uh, gone about and brought light to a lot of these these issues but for you it started quite young right you were uh, can you think of any defining moment back in in your childhood or growing up that kind of spurred you to get involved in human rights and fighting for the justice um, for against yeah. injustices. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess there are a few moments for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, certainly at school, I was I started reading. I think in high school, um, the books by John Pilger, and I think that really shocked me actually to understand more about our history and mm. our treatment of Aboriginal Australians but also what was happening in the region, in East Timor and so on. And then growing up in Perth, you know, I'm, so I'm mixed race myself. My mother's yeah. um, Chinese from Singapore, my father's English. So I'm the ch- child of, of migrants. And I remember when I was at university in Perth, when Pauline Hansen came over, and this was in the 1990s, right? This is like right. her first time round in parliament. Um, Mm -hmm. And back then, I mean, now her target has been very much Muslims, but Mm -hmm. back then it was actually Asians. And so for me, it was quite personal Mm -hmm. to hear her, you know, spouting on about how there's too much Asian immigration to Australia Mm -hmm. and and it would manifest itself in in ugly ways, um, you know, in terms of racism. So I think the very first protest that I joined was when she made a trip um, to Perth 
Wow. And it wasn't my university that hosted her for a talk, but it was another university. And, and that was the first time, I guess, that I, yeah, kind of became socially active in, in causes. And, and then through studying law at, at law school, I think I became more interested in social justice. Um, mm. And so that's where it, where it started. Yeah, I mean, look, when you just, what you just shared there, I, I feel like you've exposed even my ignorance where you talked about, uh, is it John, who was, who was the author that you? John were, Pilger. John the, Pilger. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you just like, for my own sake, uh, and I don't know who in our listeners would even un, un, know who he is. I mean, um, share a bit about what inspired you about what he shared and, and who he was? Yeah. So I guess, I mean, he's an investigative journalist. He's Australian, mm. uh, but he's based in the UK. Mm. And I guess now maybe his name might have faded a bit, you know, from headlines. And so people might not be aware um, of who he is, but he is continuing to, to write. He, he's right. still active. Um, but certainly, you know, back then in the 90s, um, he'd written a book called A Secret Country, Wow. And it was all about Australia and basically the stories that you don't read no. in the mainstream media. Um, and then he wrote, you know, he, he wrote about a lot of different things, but um, particularly about Timor um, mm -hmm. and East Timor and the way in which the Indonesian government um, invaded East Timor, the horrific wow. human rights violations that were taking place there, and really the complicity of governments like the Australian government, wow. like the US government that failed to act. And I think that's, you know, really what wow. got me interested in many ways in human rights issues was reading about this and thinking, okay, how can I, mm -hmm. yeah, how can I get involved in, you know, in addressing some of these injustices that are happening around the world? Yeah, and I think it, it always begins of just beca becoming aware of these things because these aren't things that we want to necessarily seek out and, and find about our, our dark past, you, you could say. And so it is so important. It is a, a journey, I think. I'm, in light of recent events, I'm having to um, reassess um, my own past, and our own history as a, as a country. And I think we'll get in, in to talk a bit about that in just a little bit. It'll be really good to touch on a couple of key issues that have been happening. But you got your start. You mentioned you at uni, you inspired. Mm -hmm. You got your start. Uh, I believe in Thailand, um, mm -hmm. working for an NGO. Um, I heard you became a pretty good cook. Well, at least Cam tells me. <laughs> um, and um, in fact, you met your husband Cam there. Um, is that right? I did second yeah. time round though. I, I had second two, time round. Okay. Two, uh, yeah, two stints in Thailand. Yeah. So the first time was working for an NGO. Yeah, on tell me a bit more women. about that. Um, and then the second time I was working for the UN. The UN, yeah. Tell me about, um, more about still. the first time that you were there with uh, with that NGO and you yeah. got your start. So I went, I mean, pretty much straight out of graduating from law school in, in Perth. I was 23 years old, mm. which now to me seems so young, but I remember at the time saying to my parents, of course, I'm fine. I'm going to go off and live in Bangkok and it's totally fine. Um, wow. I went actually on an Australian government program, which I don't think it exists anymore, but it was called Australian Youth Ambassadors for Development. Wow. And it was a really great program, actually, because it sent young people um, into the field, working for different NGOs, organisations, you know, sometimes governments um, in different roles, um, yeah, for a period of time. So for me, it was a 12-month 12 um, 12 program. And I really learned a lot. I mean, I was working with this small, scrappy NGO um, <laughs> on the issue of trafficking of women, which is, you know, basically the forced um, enslavement of women in the sex industry, but also in factories, in domestic work. Um, and it was an issue that was just coming to the UN's attention. Um, so I remember, I think, you know, when very early on, um, I was able to go to Geneva with mm. them. Um, and it really opened up my eyes to these issues. And it was really the right time, I think, to be working on trafficking right. because at that stage the UN was negotiating a new treaty, um, a trafficking protocol. And the focus was very much on crime and organised crime and controlling the crime of trafficking, trying to get governments to criminalise it and right. make it an offence because it wasn't wow. you know, always an offence in different countries. 
And, mm. you know, what we were trying to do is to say, this is not just a crime problem. This yeah. is a human rights right. problem. And you need to treat these people who are victims as victims with human rights and not just treat them as, you know, tools of the prosecution, mm. um, but really make sure that they're protected and supported. And I think that was one of the things that really sort of opened my eyes when I was living in Thailand is that, you know, it's not just the horrible treatment that someone gets when they're locked in a brothel and they don't have freedom to leave and, you know, the horrible stuff that happens to them. You know, it's also what happens after they're rescued by the authorities or in some cases wow. arrested by the authorities. You know, back then women were being thrown in jail because, you know, they were seen as illegal migrants or you know, in some countries, prostitution was a crime. Mm -hmm. And so they were really being, yeah, sort of double victimized, first by the traffickers, and then by the governments. So our focus was really about trying to change that. Um, and we were successful, we got the UN to include uh, human rights protections um, in that protocol. And so that sort of laid the blueprint. Um, yeah, really for governments to then enact their own laws and provide better protection for, for victims. Wow. So not only did you pioneer and help some, some groundbreaking, I guess, policy work in that whole realm of anti-trafficking, you, you ended up getting more involved, if I understand, in because you hopped over to the UK. Is that right? I mean, help me piece together um, what progress, and in particularly um, you alluded to working for the UN because – for most people, at least mm -hmm. for me, the UN working for the UN seems to be like, well, that's where you've made it, right? You 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 yeah. kind of you start in these grassroots organisations and you work your way up, and and you had some pretty incredible accomplishments. Uh, I know you probably wouldn't uh, um, freely freely share with them, but but I I know you know from your track record, um, yeah, you've really um, made some headway and, and got involved. In the UN, T tell us a bit more. Fill in the gaps there with with your journey and some of the things that you were able to work on. Yeah, so I guess at the end of the first year, um, I was meant to go back to Australia because I was on this volunteer program, mm. but I didn't want to go back. I felt like I was just starting my work with that organisation, and so I stayed. They offered me a job, and I stayed for a second year, and I finished um, the projects that I was working on and what I started. And then after two years, um, I moved to London and I got a job with Anti-Slavery International, right. which is also a small NGO, but I guess a bit bigger and maybe a bit more powerful than the one in Thailand. Um, it's actually the oldest human rights organization in the world wow. because it was set up to combat the transatlantic slave trade. Right. So it has a long, long history. Um, but they'd actually never had someone focus on trafficking before. So I was the first person no for them to set up a trafficking program because trafficking was still, you know, somewhat of a new phenomenon. It hadn't sure. really, as I said, it hadn't been defined really in international law and it, it is a contemporary form of slavery. Um, so I worked for them for about three years. I did um, some, some good work, again, sort of expanding on victim protection measures in different countries and trying to particularly work with the European Union mm. to get them to adopt um, protections for, for victims. So I did that work and then I um, travelled around a bit. I spent a bit of time in Africa, mm. um, in India, in Nepal, and then I wound up um, eventually in Hong Kong um, doing some contract work initially for the UN, mm. um, for the International Labour Organization. Um, and again, it was sort of assisting them on projects to do with trafficking of women, um, mm. trafficking of children, um, but also looking at migrant workers. And then when I moved back to Bangkok the second time, it was to take up a job um, within the UN, right. uh, working for the ILO on, on these issues. And yeah, I mean, like you, I sort of thought, I'm working for the UN now. I've sure. made it. Like, right. you know, now I'm going to have the money and the budgets mm -hmm. um, and the clout to really achieve systemic change on, on these issues. And, you know, I was working with some good people at the UN, but ultimately, you know, it's a massive bureaucratic organization. Right. And it's, it's very tough. Like, decisions are made for political reasons. Mm -hmm. And I found it very hard 
to make the systemic change that I felt like was necessary. Right. Um, certainly in the roles that I had then, you know, in sort of, I guess, you know, junior to sort of mid-level policy roles. So, you know, I gave it a go. I also worked for UN Women for a year, mm -hmm. and that was on a project dealing with um, migrant workers, so particularly women um, from Southeast Asian countries right. who were going to the Middle East for work, uh, particularly as domestic workers was a big part of our focus. Um, and again, you know, if you're working in the home, in some ways you're even more isolated than if you're working in a brothel, right? Wow. And so it's extremely difficult to get help if your employer is abusive. Right. Um, so we, again, we uncovered some pretty horrible stuff. And what we were really trying to do is to get governments to provide sort of more support and more protection so that if people ran away from those conditions, they would be supported and not just, yeah. you know, deported back to their and, home countries. And I can relate um, because these are, at the end of the day, they're, they're people, they're humans that have um, family that are, that are suffering in so many ways. And uh, even my own experience living in Iraq and trying to respond to quite urgent crises and having to, to see the way the bureaucratic system kind of rolls and works can really get, can really get challenging when you're, when you're day to day faced with some just, like you said, people that might not have the access, the ability, even if they wanted to, 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 to get the support and help to get out of the situations that they're in. So, um, I can, I can completely, re re um, you know, relate, um, to that. Um, but I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and bring things back to kind of this moment that we're at, at the moment, um, because I know mm -hmm. you, um, have been, uh, and your, your team here in Australia have been working very, very hard for a long time, even before what we're seeing now with the protests with Black Lives Matter and our own Aboriginal Lives Matter, um, um, kind of slant on, on that and the way Australia is being having to reconcile with its racist past and present and also reconcile with um, just s some simple things. Uh, um, um, I wouldn't say simple things. The, the issue that is, I think, at the forefront, uh, Aboriginal deaths in custody and the inaction that has gone on for years and years. But you guys have been working in that space long before uh, what we're seeing in, in, um, ha that has been sparked by the death of George Floyd in the USA. Can you can yeah. you share a bit more a bit about what Human Rights Watch is doing, what you've been involved with, and and I think just you know share with our listeners, help us understand um, some of the maybe more nuanced things that we we don't really fully get when we just watch the media today. Yeah, I mean, I think. You know, this is a really incredible time. The world is in a real moment. And I think, you know, what happened to George Floyd, when I saw that video, I was shocked and horrified, as I think anyone watching that video mm. is. But it also immediately made me think of the case of David Dungay here in Australia, who also said, wow. I can't breathe mm. more than 12 times before he died. And he was an Aboriginal man who was in prison. He was being restrained by four prison guards. And there's been no justice for that, mm. for that killing. It was also captured on video, um, you know, but the coronial report did not um, recommend any disciplinary action. So, you know, Human Rights Watch's work, I guess, in these issues, we've been doing quite a lot of work around prisons and particularly how prisoners with disabilities are being treated. And it might surprise people to know that more than half the prison population in Australia has a disability. Wow. Now, that's, that's not just physical. More it's, than it's half. It's huge. More than wow. half. Just over half. And so that's physical, that's sensory, that's cognitive impairments, um, but it also includes mental health conditions. Mm. And that's the main um, issue here. But our prisons are really not set up to deal with disabilities at all. Um, prisons are set up for punishment. Right. And so the situation we have now is we have these overcrowded prisons. We have too many people in there. Um, we have a lot of people who actually really urgently need mental health support and they're not really getting it in prison. 
And many of these people are Aboriginal. I mean, we know that our Aboriginal population is what, only 3% or something of the Australian population, and yet 27% of those who wind up in prisons. Um, So there is a lot of work that needs to be done to make prisons, you know, not only better for people with disabilities, but also more appropriate, um, culturally appropriate for Aboriginal people. And I think that's why we have, you know, there's so much attention now on on deaths in custody. Um, just last year, I was in WA, up in Broome and in Perth, investigating a few different cases of deaths mm. in custody. One was a horrible case um, of an Aboriginal man uh, with schizophrenia who was beaten to death by other inmates in the prison. Mm. One of the other cases was an Aboriginal man who had a long history of being in and out of prison. Um, but he also had a long history of mental health um, right. mental health needs. Mm. Um, and he had to go to court one day. He left his home not thinking that he was going to wind up in prison. He actually said to his mum, you know, leave the chicken out. I'll cook dinner tonight, mum. Mm. And then he went off to court. Mm. And unfortunately, the relative who was meant to post bail for whatever reason wasn't in court that day. And so they took him to the broom prison. And he was known to to those um, prison guards. I mean, he'd been in and out of prison. Mm. You know, they knew that he had a mental health condition, yet he wasn't given support. And all the warning signs were there. He started asking for his medication. He started banging his head against the wall. Anyway, within a few hours, he'd hung himself oh. um, in, in the shower. And his name was uh, Mr. Jacamara. Um, so, you know, these cases, there are so many of these cases, which I think cut very close to home when we are marching, you know, for Black Lives Matter. Right. We are also marching about the systemic changes that are needed to our system here in Australia to ensure that, you know, pervasive racism um, doesn't result in, in so many Aboriginal people winding up in, in custody. You know, I think it's important we tell these stories. Um it's easy to be indifferent when someone is just a statistic, but when you hear their stories as you faithfully share on behalf of these families, what is going on, it's important for us to listen and take note because 30 years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody. And yet there doesn't seem to be that much, if any meaningful action Truly, that's taken place. I mean, you can you sh- can you share a bit about that, and maybe some of the maybe some of the a- action yeah. that Human Rights Watch is working towards to ensure that something's done about this. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, there was that Royal Commission thirty years ago, and I mean, I think the greatest change that has happened since then are physical changes to the prison infrastructure. So basically making it more difficult to be completely blunt, um, making it more difficult for people to hang themselves in prison so people don't have, you know, the tools or the ability to to do that. But that's clearly nowhere near enough, you know. Like that's not addressing the reason why people feel that way, The why, why people would, you know, get to that point. And, right. you know, the problem is, um, you know, prisoners – often find it very difficult to get access to counselling. Um, the way in which these issues are treated is often just putting someone in a safe cell, a padded cell, uh, which is you know supposedly a place where they're under closer observation and monitoring mm-hmm. 24 hours, um, but it's not necessarily a place where they're going to get better. So what we're really recommending is um, that... Prisoners with disabilities, particularly mental health conditions, aren't held in solitary confinement, but they do have better access to mental health support, more right. psychologists, better treatment, and that also there's more um, more spaces in psychological, uh, psychiatric uh, facilities uh-huh. to provide support because that was one of the big problems that we found. I mean, in WA, there's something like there's less than 50 forensic beds for psych patients in a secure facility. Wow. So it's constantly full. Like you think right. about that and then you think about the prison population in WA, which I think is more than 4,000. Like 
clearly that is not enough. Right. Um, and those beds are also serving people in the community. So you wind up with people in prison who just don't have the right kind of support. So, you know, it's about providing the right types of support, um, yeah, so that people don't have suicidal thoughts, that they're not thinking, um, you know, about about killing themselves and so that they're protected in prison so that they have people to talk to, having more independent oversight um, and monitoring. It's It's really important. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me almost a worldview picture in one sense your concept and idea of what punishment is there for is it therefore just mm. to to punish something i mean my upbringing i i you know when i think about my upbringing that i had i had incredible parents and um the and and even even the, my faith that that i would say uh, helped informed the value of human life and human dignity. But I do remember a time, I think I was 14, and my, my aunt and uncle, I was in the UK, uh, they challenged me on what I believed about capital punishment. And, you know, I was 14, so, you know, uh, you could probably forgive me for not really thinking it through. But for me, I just didn't see it was a problem if the crime fit, you know, you know capital punishment seemed to be a viable option. But what it cuts to the heart at for me and as I've grown, as I've, as I've raised, as I'm trying to, at the best of my ability, raise four children is when I when I discipline my children, it's it's to bring them, it's to restore them, I guess, is to bring them into a better place in the future. It's not just to purely be punitive in the way we do this. And I think it touches on a bit of our our worldview, our psych, the way we 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 approach this issue in general would you agree yeah absolutely i mean i think that's a big problem with our prison system is it really is set up and it's about punishment and you know i mean i think some of the hardest cases that we worked on were people who were being held in what they call sort of the maximum security units mm -hmm. so they're very high security units these are people who maybe they haven't been following the rules of the prison Maybe they've been violent. Maybe they've attacked other prisoners or prison sure. staff. Um, but they're basically fed, you know, through a grate. They have no real human contact. If they talk to anyone, it's always through glass or, or through a wall. And, I mean, I think that's really just basically giving up on people. You mm. know, like one of the people that – one of the cases that we were following, he'd been in one of those units for 12 years and it's like, how can you expect someone like that? No, that's mind boggling. Even to mm. be able to go back to the regular prison, let alone be released into the community after living like that. Um, and even guys that we interviewed in, in Queensland and who just come out of those MSU units. So sometimes they're sent there for, you know, six months, three months. You know, we were interviewing them just as they'd come out. Right. And they would say to us, it's actually really hard to talk to you and to hold a conversation. I'm really struggling. Could you come back tomorrow? Mm. And I think it just gives you this sense that wow. people are sent there for punishment. Then they come out. They can't cope with suddenly all the noise and the riffraff of the normal prison. And so then again, they commit, you know, a, you know, a violation. It's just a cycle of And then they get sent back. It's just an, it's an endless cycle, really, isn't it, at the end of it the really day? It really is. Um, and, um, yeah, and particularly I think for the Aboriginal population in mm -hmm. Australia, yeah, it is this endless cycle. You know, many of the people we interviewed, it was their fifth, sixth, seventh wow. time in, in prison. And so it's about how we can have a justice system that is about supporting people, rehabilitating right. people. Not so just that, sending them you know, to prison not, for petty crimes or for misdemeanors you know i think of the story about ben and jerry the founder of ben and jerry's ice cream he's on the forefront now in the u.s he's for a long time advocated for for black lives um and for for those that are vulnerable and 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 systemically oppressed in the u.s and he he talks about this moment i remember i don't know if it was a a short little video clip or a tweet or something where he says, look, I, I, I shudder to think what happened when I was caught with marijuana back in the 70s if I was if I was black. There probably would not have been a Ben & Jerry's ice cream. I'd probably still be in prison to this day. 
And just that kind of statement, he was right. I mean, yeah. and and I think what you're alluding to here is Aboriginal, Indigenous Australians have got the raw end of the deal. They've not been, we haven't done our job to serve them, to understand them um, and their, their, their needs. Um, and I've got both hands up. And in, in saying, look, I I need to understand. I need to learn. I need to put myself um, in their place. Um, it's incredible work yeah. that you're doing. I think we're all, I think we're all still learning. And I mean, on the on the positive side, we have had yes. some recent good news. The WA government has just passed a law saying that uh, people will not have to go to jail for unpaid fines. Wow. Um, now, this law has been a long time coming. Wow. It is really in response to the death of uh, Miss Du in police custody mm. back in 2014. Um, she was taken into custody actually after a domestic violence um, dispute and they realised she had some unpaid fines, so they took her into custody mm. um, as, as well as her abuser um, and she wound up dead in custody. But, you know, look, it's been six years, so mm-hmm. it's taken a long time. But I think it's a really important step um, that the WA government has has made this important change. Yeah. And no one should be going to jail just for, you know, something simple like, like unpaid fines. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and there's a couple other, um, uh, I think, points of action um, that you alluded to earlier um, in around how we address, how we become more prepared in, in whether it be better trained staff and a few other the other ways that we can um, make sure we're addressing because these issues are, are kind of they're nuanced they're not simple um, human rights did, watch did a, a study you you, you um, across I think was it um, all the countries where you kind of did a study France was one of them um, oh yeah they were different um, so they were different reports but basically we've done a series of reports looking at how prisoners with disabilities are being treated right. um, in different countries. Right. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to see in each country the problems are slightly different. There's no silver bullet so, answer, right? To this, no, yeah. no, there really aren't. Um, so, yeah, the issue in the US was really around excessive use of force, mm-hmm. unfortunately, um, and restraints of physical restraints used against people with disabilities, especially mental health conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, in France, the issue was over-medicating and forcibly medicating yeah. uh, people with mental health conditions. And here, the issue was really overuse of solitary confinement okay. um, on these issues. But, you know, as you said, I mean, I think, you know, there has been a bit of progress. We put that report out on Australia two years ago. Um, I was back in WA meeting with some prison staff And, you know, I think, you know, one of the staff actually said to me, I read your report and it really made me think twice about how I do my welfare checks with prisoners. Wow. And that, you know, and that I'm I'm so glad to hear that they are actually reading our report because you never know if they they do or not. Um, And I hope that they're actually adopting some of those recommendations of like better training in mental health support for prison staff from prison guards because it's a really tough job. You know, it's not an easy job to work in the prison system at all. Um, But it's about, yeah, learning ways to sort of de-escalate certain behaviours, learning ways to identify um, different types of mental health conditions and what's an appropriate way to to respond. Uh, We've got to invest. We, we, I mean... Personal development is key. I mean, some teachers have a hard time going into school these days to teach and, and let alone uh, yeah. going into a prison system, a maximum security prison system and, and having to, you know, um, you know, sometimes, you know, be in harm's way. And there, there's a lot, there's a lot um, that these men and women do um, that goes unseen. You're right. Um there's so much we could talk about that. Uh, I know your time is precious and I think we could easily um, <laughs> have you back on to talk about some some more issues. But I'd like to, if you have um, some time before you, before you go, just to touch on something that's a bit close closer to my heart. But I know something that has been an ever-present issue for Australia um, 
and it's with the offshore detention um, policy that Australia's had, mm. and really ge- in general, asylum seekers at large for decades now, it's been a highly polit- politicised issue. Um, it's been an issue that um, sadly has been um, a blight, I think, on Australia's human rights record um, internationally. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's close to my heart because, you know, I, I spent recently spent uh, three years in in uh, northern Iraq, almost three and a half years. Um, and my time there working with basically right after ISIS invaded, or well, the day ISIS invaded, our family moved there. And we, we um, responded with a small NGO to work with refugees that were fleeing displaced people that were flooding into the re- region overnight. And after our time there, we moved back to Australia. My wife had our baby number four, but it spurred our our passion to start an NGO that we started, a charity called You Belong, helping these refugees that have, have, have been granted refugee status, most of them from um, Syria and Iraq, and, and many of these families that, that uh, we, we know their relatives. We, we worked and visited them in their camps, and we and, and it's... It's it's been very close to me, home for me personally, but um, I'd love for you to share a bit about what's been going on with Nauru. I understand you got got the chance to visit there, spend time with uh, a Kurdish. I was in the Kurdish region, a Kurdish uh, mm-hmm. refugee asylum seeker. Um, I don't, I got to stop talking. Why don't you share a bit a bit about your experience there and 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 kind of. Yeah, help inform us on on what's been going on and in that space. Yeah, no, and I really want to commend you on the incredible work that you've done, Tim. Also in the refugee space, you know, in Iraq, I think it's yeah. I mean, you've seen firsthand how people right. have had to flee their homes, and so you know how difficult it is for people. And I think. Yeah, I think sometimes for Australians, when people were seeing the images of co- people coming on the boats, it is quite difficult to know, you know, what are the backgrounds of these people? Who right. are they? Where do they come from? What are they fleeing? Um, and this is an issue that's very important to me too. I mean, mm-hmm. I feel like it's been in July, it will be seven years since we've had the offshore processing um, in Papua New Guinea and now re- restarted. Um, it was obviously something that was proposed by Rudd. It happened previously under the Howard era, mm-hmm. um, but then was restarted again. And around the time that that started was actually around the time that I moved from New York to Australia to set mm. up Human Rights Watch. So I feel like this has been an issue that we've been working on from day one. Yeah. And, you know, I visited Manus Island in Papua New Guinea twice. Um, I met with many of the refugees and asylum seekers. I went in, I think it was 2015 and then 2017. So I actually saw the steady deterioration in people mm. as well in their mental mm. health over that time. I met with Beruz Bachani, who mm. you know is the Kurdish I think I've uh, got refugee. His book behind me is uh, he wrote He's, a book uh, called uh, No Friends But the Mountains, which actually is a Kurdish proverb, just so you know. If you ever read his book, uh, Beruz Bachani, it's um yeah that 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 yeah. it's a nation that has been traumatized a whole people group and whole ethnicity that has been traumatized their 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 two main proverbs are we're the orphans of the universe and we have no friends but the mountains get that for your uh your kind of um yeah your national uh, or ethnic identity when that's kind of your your go-to proverb but anyway sorry to to to, di- to no, you know, distract it's an incredible. you there incredible book yeah. um, and so incredible that he wrote it under those conditions of, you know, wow. basically being imprisoned on, on Manus Island. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, people think, oh, you know, it must be so horrible to, to go there and to witness these conditions. But you meet, you know, young men who are so inspiring, who mm. are smart, who are so switched on, they've managed to make it all the way there. Goodness. Like they would be such good citizens for right. Australia if only the Australian government, you know, would would let them, yeah, would let them in. Um, but instead, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for New Zealand. I mean, Beruz, is, he managed right. to make his way to New Zealand to speak at a writer's festival about mm-hmm. his book. And, um, you know, I think he'll really go a long way. I was in a, 
I was at a conference speaking about migration in Germany um, a year ago, and there were academics from all over the world debating his book, which was just incredible to see. Mm. And I think that's one of the really great things is he is not letting that experience, you know, really define who he is as a person. Wow. And I think that's something that's really important to a lot of the refugees who have been through that experience. You know, I was in Chicago last year and I met up with some of the refugees that I'd previously met on Manus and some of the ones who are on Nauru. And they just said to me, Elaine, I'm so glad that I don't have that word refugee wow. plastered across my face How anymore. That's all that? I felt. I just felt like refugee, refugee. You know, the guards would call you by your boat number. Mm. They were like, here in Chicago, they call me by my name. Oh, wow. If they don't know my name, they call me sir. Like, mm. it's just such a different experience for people. Um, and those camps, they're so militarized. They're told, you know, when to eat, when to sleep, what to do. They would get wandered, you know, going from one part of the camp to, to the other. Um, those camps have now been dismantled, but they've just been shunted, you know, from one island basically to another, from Manus to Port Moresby. Wow. And now they're, you know, living in pretty horrible conditions. There's only a few hundred or so um, left now in Papua New Guinea. Hmm. Um, but they're really worried that, you know, as attention focuses on all the other things that are happening around the world, um, that people will forget about the people who are there. Yeah. And so I think it's important for all of us that we don't forget about them. Right. Um, and that we do what we can to, you know, remind the Australian government that just because you didn't let them in here doesn't mean you don't have any responsibility to the, to these people. Yeah. Look, uh, I know I could do more. I know hopefully many of our listeners um, feel encouraged and inspired to do more. Um, not all of us have the opportunity to go travel to these places to hear the stories. But again, once again, once you hear the stories, I mean, the sky hasn't falling. There's many that have moved here to Australia mm. that came from yes. Manus Island and, and it's not like the sky's fallen and, and you know, everything is, you know, um, ex you know, there's issues left, right and centre. I mean, um, I think if we can get beyond the fear, if we can get beyond the rhetoric, get beyond beyond nameless statistics and really hear the stories i think yeah i think that there is something good in all of us something appealing to to our core um core humanity really our common humanity that this that that we are better than this that we can be leaders in this space and not and not uh not followers so thank you elaine is there anything else you I feel the need to share on this. I know our time is kind of running running out. Uh, I want to give you that opportunity to share. Um, um, I mean, I think just, I mean, on that refugee issue, mm. we're also continuing to, you know, battle for the rights of those who've been transferred to Australia. Mm -hmm. Some of them are living in the community. Some of them have jobs. Okay. Um, but, you know, obviously they've been affected pretty badly by COVID because right. many of those jobs aren't secure and probably have been uh, interrupted. And some of them are still being detained. They're being held in hotels in Brisbane, in Melbourne. They're put in hotels rather than detention centres because they're a low security threat. But, I mean, it's going on like <laughs> it's been more than nine months now. Like can you no. imagine being no, in a hotel a, room for nine I mean, months? It's a prison. It's home detention really. I mean, it's... Yeah, it, is. it doesn't, and so, doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we need to do more to address some of these issues that, you know, our government is, yes, you know, really just penalising these people yeah. because they had the audacity to try and reach this country by boat and they were looking for safety. Um, and certainly seven years later, they still haven't found it. Um, so I think we need to do what we can to, to support them and I guess I would just let people know, you know, if you're interested in our work, please yes. go to our website, um, hrw.org. hrw.org. Is there an Australian branch of that or is it just HRW? Um, I had a good squiz at HRW um, recently and it's so informative, so many stories. Um, it is really good. But yeah, is there any... I mean, the global site 
is sort of the main one, but yep. also, I mean, we have a Human Rights Watch Australia uh, Facebook page yep. and Instagram. Follow on um, Twitter. I'm on Twitter. All those things, um, yes. Tweeting quite a lot. Look, look days, up Elaine so. on Twitter. <laughs> is there anything new coming up for you, Elaine? Anything on the horizon other than not so much travel? <laughs> Um, well, right now we're doing quite a lot of work around, I guess, the Human Rights Council. It's Australia's okay. last year on the Human Rights Council. Okay. So we're addressing some of those issues. We're going to have a new report, um, short report coming out looking at deaths okay. in custody related to disability in Excellent. Western Australia. Um, so that look out for that. That'll be in the next couple of months. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, unfortunately with covid COVID itself has resulted in a whole range of, you know, new human rights issues, particularly sure. for vulnerable communities. Um, so we're doing quite a lot of work also in drawing attention to that um, and particularly the way in which some authoritarian governments are using the excuse of COVID really to ram through national security legislation or, you know, take certain measures to further crack down um, on their citizens, and mm. we're seeing that in the Philippines, seeing that in Cambodia, and I think that's something that Australians should be very concerned about as, you know, governments in our region become more authoritarian. Incredible. Elaine, I once heard it said that um, fighting injustice is making somebody else's problem your problem, and I think that is what Human Rights Watch is doing. It's what you are doing. Thank you so much for standing up for those that are oppressed, those that are um, suffering persecution, those that are vulnerable in so many ways in our society and standing up for them. Thank you for all that you're doing. Um, I hope to be able to get you back on uh, the show again and and explore some, some more things and, and hear what you've been up to and what uh, I think great progress, I believe, is is and will be made um but thanks so much for for coming on elaine I, i've thoroughly enjoyed it and i know you've had a busy day and i appreciate you carving that out time out for that no no problem at all it's been a pleasure thanks so much for having me tim you got it